G'day and welcome again to the Campfire Project pa panel discussion. And today, first of all, I have with me Adam Riddell, who is a mental health worker. How are you, Adam? Yeah, good. How are you? Very good, thanks. And we have uh, Lance Piccioni, who is the CEO of Love Me, Love You Foundation. How are you, Lance? Great, thanks, Alan. I appreciate it, and thanks for having me in the campfire. Well, it's good to have you here in your first uh, panel discussion, which is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And then we have uh, Maria Paterakis, who is the midlife counsellor. How are you, Maria? I'm very well, and you definitely have my name worked out completely now. <laughs> I got it right because I didn't stop and think about it. That was the whole thing I did last time. Guys, I, I pronounced the name. I was trying to get it right beforehand. As soon as we went on there, I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's all good. So like when you, know, you were saying before, Lance, no pressure. Yeah, I put the pressure on me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most definitely. This is the thing with uh, the European names or a name that's a bit different and people ask, well, how do you pronounce it? Well, it's exactly the way it's spelled. Hmm. That's the how, it's, how you pronounce it. Hmm. So let's get it right. Exactly. So well done on two fronts. And Lance, does yours mean a little something as well? Because mine means little father. No, um, well... Piccioni, as it's spelt now, is uh, is the westernised version of the original. So it's actually got a couple of J's that are supposed to be in there. Uh, uh, my, dad's, uh, my dad's Romanian, um, and uh, when they come out here uh, through the immigration camps and landed in the, in the country just under fifty years ago now, um, he uh, they dropped one J at the time, and then over over time he dropped the other J. So actually, uh, Piccioni, if you ask in Italian, um, it means uh, pigeon. So We'll go with actually the, the original version. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, uh, you can thank uh, all of them and that for dropping the J's. It made my job a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, look at it. And, and mine as well, mate. They're going to get it wrong at some point as well. So, Excellent. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it was Maria, you actually put forward a suggestion for the subject today be, to be on resilience. You know, you know, people feel that their resilience is being battered at the moment. Uh, but the question is, what is real resilience and how do we endure through times like these? So could I ask you, if uh, Maria, if you'd like to start us off? Oh, I'd love to start us off. And I think that you're exactly right. I think people have um, a certain idea of what resilience is that may be unhelpful. They might have uh, minimised their resilience or they might have think that they're in the middle. They thought they were resilient and then they're going, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not as resilient as I thought I was because we are going through things that we haven't expected to go through before. But I, I guess my take on resilience is very much you have already been through many challenges of your, in your life mm -hmm. and you already have so many skills and so many strengths and talents. It's sometimes we can just lose our way a little bit um, and that's okay. Stop putting so much pressure on yourself. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It comes, yeah. with a, it comes with a level of expectations at the moment. Obviously, you see the tricky times where we have dealt with challenging experiences, you know, for our whole life. And, you know, generations before have been through even worse you know, in terms of the social um, issues and, and things that are about impacting our lives. And, you know, the level of expectations of people going through, you know, both socially and family in terms of their, their ability in the workspace. Um, you know, I think people are, you know, at this current time, um, becoming a bit more understanding of how they actually pull on their resilience expectations mm. back a bit, and, and taking those learnings from what we are dealing with at this current in this current situation. Because you know, if you had said to us at the start of the year, I'm in Victoria, and had said to us at the start of the year that you know the next six months of the first six months of uh, 2020 is not going to is going to be fully bushfire ravaged place and the impact that that's going to have on our community and, and our state and uh, states sorry and then, then we're going to go into lockdown for three months and then you're going to come out of it and we're going to be okay and then you're going to go back into lockdown mm -hmm. so you know it's that sort of understanding you go well how am i supposed to deal with that but my, my belief you know in with, with the resilience is understanding how we've become more mindful in our learning from the current situation yeah and, and the exactly. more that we the more that we bottle it up and not you know, connect our feelings and emotions and our learning with these experiences, the more we're going to play that victim. And, you know, and people are going to go, oh, yeah, I'm not as resilient as I want. But you are. Mm. We're still living. We're still rocking. We're still mm. doing yeah. You know, but if you, if the way we move forward with it is to be able to take action with it. 
understand it and then we take action for it because you know the lessons learned the better lessons learned are the ones that you learn like that in, 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 in the moment if you have to wait you know if you have to wait till post covid to understand how resilient i'm going to be through this situation it's too late you know, so yeah, how do i make exactly. i'm moving that forward yeah yeah i think lance just touched on a really really good point there around resilience is kind of that action side of things and i, I think that most australians and look maria you, you're probably a bit more of a, the, the expert here in resilience but I, overall i think australians are going to be you know very resilient bunch you know as, as lance said we've just gone through bushfires before that there was another crisis now we've just gone through COVID. we've just come out of lockdown now we're going back in lockdown like the, the growth that we're going to go through is going to be crazy uh, for me, I feel like uh, resilience comes through action. So, you know, it's, it's what did what happened to me? What did I learn from that? Okay, let's move past that and let, let's keep growing. And to me, that's where true resilience comes from. So I guess I would love to learn, you know, a bit more from you and kind of get your input there, of, you know, to you what re real resilience is, um, you know, being, being, I guess, the expert on this, this subject. Oh, I, I think that we're all a little bit expertish here <laughs> because yes. we've all got aspects. I think I think I'd like to talk about my own personal mm. challenge with resilience, and that is the biggest challenge I ever had, and I've had a lot, but one that really defined my outlook on resilience, I guess, would be I had a miscarriage um, in in between my two children and i'm a counselor i've got a psychology background i was working for lifeline at the time i'm a resilient person i can handle this mm. but then i started feeling myself going down the tunnel right mm. Mm. and i knew it was coming I, I knew you could feel it coming and because awareness is a really key thing in resilience you've got to be really aware and engaged with yourself i turned to my husband and i said i need a day I just need a day to be on my own or two just to mourn and work work my through my feelings for it and and work through it just need that time so take our daughter just go and give me the space to do what i need to do no. so he did that and i used all my techniques and all of my and i'm really lucky i've got a really hardy tool belt um so if you don't have a hardy tool belt talk to someone and get yourself a hardy tool belt um, but yeah, I have a really hardy tool belt, went in and then I rang people where I needed to and I, and I used all of my skills and over that weekend I processed so much stuff and then I realised that resilience is not about falling, it's about how you learn to get up again and that's, that's really fair. what they talk about. Mm -hmm. It's never about whether or not you're going to fall. Life is full of waves, it's full of storms, mm -hmm. we're all going to have moments. Yeah. It's what we do in that moment that makes the difference. Yeah. yeah. And it's a choice. Mm. It's a choice. But I, I ask the question, do I have to fall and get back up to show resilience? Can't I just, what about those people that, you know, those people that are succeeding in certain things in life that they're going through and they do, they're bang, bang. Is their level of resilience any less because they haven't fallen or how does that work? Uh, I think that it's a different level of resilience. I think that once you start to learn and learn and learn, how far the fall is, is changes. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? So the threshold yeah. changes, not the pain threshold. Your pain yeah. threshold improves. Yeah. You're yeah. able to endure more. You're able to endure more quickly and yeah. recover more quickly because you're far more aware. You're far yeah. more connected with yourself. You've made a commitment. You're open-minded. Oh, If I was to say, the, the aspects of a resilient mindset it's more than optimism it's being aware it's being open-minded mm. adaptable decisive and also really committed to resilience and that whole process and getting up and up and up and yeah. ascending it's not it's not really about bouncing back but continuing the ascension of growing in your life and accepting that as part of your norm that's the difference so instead of bouncing back could i bounce through yeah. yeah, why you not? Know, you said it's a lot to do with the, one of the words that comes out to me out of all of that was the awareness. Because as mm -hmm. you just said, um, Lance, some people go down deep and others just seem to be able to keep moving forward. And mm -hmm. I think they are resilient, but it, it's all about the awareness that they have around it. I think okay. it's a major thing because if you're focused on the fact that you're falling, that's all you're going to be able to see and you'll, you'll fall further because of it. Yeah. Whereas the people who are looking have awareness around it, 
they've got that resilience. They're pulling on the knowledge that they've had before, what they've worked through, yeah. but also looking forward in where they're heading. So they're, resi- they're just resilient in a different way. So resilience, yeah. as I see, is a whole mass of different things. And how, you know, how you bring those together, it depends on how it's going to appear to you and how other people are going to observe you as well. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I, I really love this concept of resilience because I think, um, and look, thank you for sharing, Maria. It was really quite a powerful story. Um, going to, to, I guess, Lance's, uh, I guess, status of, you know, can someone be resilient without falling? You know, I guess what, what Maria said is you got to have that awareness because I would say those people have fallen somewhere to have that resilience to know, okay, I've gone from here to here. Now, how do I get back up to here? So I guess that's where the, the resilience would come in there. Um, you know, I guess w- within my, my own, I guess my own personal life there too, um, you know, I, I, I've kind of had a lot of experience with resilient, resilience and I believe a lot of self-esteem comes from the ability to be resilient. So for myself, I guess, you know, you, you kind of dabble in that, that mental health aspect and, and you always see, you know, when someone has, you know, massive resilience, their self-esteem goes up, everything else sort of sort of goes up and, and increases. So, you know, I, I, 100% hand in hand, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Mm. And I, and I uh, just wanted to add to that is that um, there are people experiencing different processes here. Yes, there are people who have gone through everything that you talked about, Lance, but there's also people who were kind of like on a hamster wheel and life was just Mm. chugging along and they've suddenly had their hamster wheel smashed and it's not going to get repaired Mm. and they can't fix it and they have to rethink their whole perspective on what life was Mm. and how it's going to go from here. And what I would say to that is that there's this transition that's happening for a lot of people of who they used to be and who they're going to become and there's this intense juiciness in the middle there like this big burger right (laughs) and opportunity it 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 can be a vegan burger if you want to yeah make it (laughs) gluten-free dairy-free whatever you want big Um, meaty meaty resilience burger (laughs) that's where the transformation is and if you are afraid of change and transformation you're just not you're going to struggle through that Mm. that's what resilience is all about it's about adapting changing allowing yourself to transform allowing yourself to grow and re and you might need to rethink a whole bunch of things but you know what that's awesome and if you Mm. are afraid of that um that's probably the first thing to tackle yeah yeah Yeah. i mean with those people that uh you said don't tackle it the usual question that they sell, ask themselves or ask, ask out to the world is the, the whole, why me? Mm. Yeah. Why am I going through this? Well, because it's a learning experience and we need to, we need to work through these, these experiences and learn from them better and better. And you're not going to get it right the first time. You're not going to get it right the second time. You're not going to get it right the third time. You maybe never, ever get it right. Mm. But as long as you're having a, having a crack at it and understanding it a bit more, and then every time you get a little bit better, a little bit better, you know, the end goal is that you know that you, you learn from those experiences and you just create that level of talk, talk about this awareness the self-awareness component is that you know people are also in this world are, are afraid to have that conversation with themselves as well mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're afraid to say who am i really like what what is it that i what what, what am i what, what what's my purpose here what, what am i what am i trying to leave behind in my every day not in my in my life Mm. What am I trying to leave behind in my every day? And, and how yeah. do I understand the impact that I'm having? But if I don't understand the impact that I'm having on myself, I, I, I understand how I'm going to have the impact on others. You know, and I can be, you know, I can tell myself, oh, I'm strong, I'm strong, strong like bull, all this sort of stuff. But unless you genuinely feel it and genuinely understand it for who you are and mm. how it goes about, you, you can talk crap all day to yourself, mm. but you're only lying to yourself, and that's not going to help you. It's not helping your cause. And there's, Definitely not going to help the people around you. No, you know, no. And we, we have this big thing around, um, you know, your perception, we were, like physical perception a lot of resilience. Mm. You know, we, we always look to see resilience as a strong, a strong characteristic in people and that is then becomes through a, a visual thing. So I look, oh, they look, they might, they look resilient. Mm. Sort of thing. Resilience has nothing to do with stature, nothing to do with physical presence, nothing to do with all sort of stuff. It, it's a genuine in here. 
yeah. the feeling that you'd be able to connect this to here and make it work. Because if I don't learn from my experiences and I don't understand who I am, I'm going to keep playing the victim card. But the world that we're living in at the moment is that people are attaching themselves to the victim. Hmm. They, they play the, everyone's playing the victim card. We, we, we're going to get out of this. We're going to keep staying in this rut. And you know, the, the, all, the, all the hoo-ha and going on about the fact that the lockdowns and all these situations that are happening at the moment, this is the world. Hmm. You've got to learn from these. You know, as I talked about before, you've got to learn from the experiences right now. I don't know I'm sure what's going to go on in three months' time. You don't know what's going to go on tomorrow. Exactly. So the more we can actually accept that, um, the more resilient and resilience is not just as an individual, it is as a collective. The, you know, people ask us in my in my role, they love me, love you. People ask us, how do we how do we become more of a resilience workplace? <laughs> yeah. Well, well starts with you. One of my passions. Yeah, yeah, it is. But it's you know how do we do that? Well. It's not just resilience, throw the, resi the word resilience out. And there's the whole the holistic value in the approach that we need to be able to take to that and creating that self-understanding, self-awareness, the acknowledgement to the to the, the your everyday, acknowledgement to the people around you. And then, you know, creating those conversations and, and allowing that, you talked about space before that you needed Maria in that, in that time. So you need to be able to create that space for everybody to be able to, to, be able to grow because if you, you know, resilience is like a, it's a, it's a flower, you know, you, you need to give it some space, but you need to water it, you need to nurture it, you need to make it work, and you keep investing in it. Mm -hmm. if, you, if it's, resilience is not a yucca, you know, <laughs> it's, it, need, it needs care. So, yeah, I hear the word resilience is more, it's more a title than anything else. It's, yeah. it's a thing that you, you can see that you've created or whatever, but it's all the stuff that leads up to that, that creates a, that, therefore you have a resilience mm. so, it's a practice it's a, it's a thought process the action we take and everything else but I love the term and I reckon it's a great one uh, as you said Lance now uh, have a crack at it I yeah. love that and that's virtually what it is it's having a, a go at it but it's also that you talked about the uh, the wave of things coming up and going down in life yeah. I keep thinking of uh, when I first started uh, surfing like riding a, um, a surf ski and I got wiped out over and over again because I went to get on the wave I pulled back and all the rest of it mm. it was only when I attacked the wave really drove into it that I really took off and had a great time so you have got you've got to become part of the process not just standing back and as yeah. you said everybody seems to be happy with being a victim and there's got to be a secondary gain in that why mm. do they want to be the victim how do they get that kudos out of it how do they feel good about being a victim so finding that in helping him to find a direction, I think is important. I, 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 uh, I agree a hundred percent. And it's that idea that I take 100% responsibility for what happens in my mm. self in here internally and how I respond to the world around me. And when you do that, as fearful as it sounds, cause then I have no excuses. Yeah. Um, it, life becomes actually more exciting and more mm -hmm. vibrant and you're leaning into things instead of running away from things. One of the things that people do is they run. What they don't realise is they're running with an elastic band around their waist and it keeps bringing them back, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. unless you address that thing, that paradigm, that belief, that um, I call it conditional dreaming, any condition that stops you from your resilience, your achievements, your um, success in life, your potential, then hmm. you are just bouncing back. And so people who are resilient face those things over and over again. They lean hmm. into them. They don't run from them. They acknowledge them. They doesn't mean they don't have spackapoos and hmm. or, or go nuts a bit sometimes and, you know, have, have moments of tantrums. It's like when you have that moment. I mean, I still have tantrums sometimes. I acknowledge it. Hmm. But I, when I do, I go, ooh, what was that? Yeah. Hmm. Where did that come from? what was going on there and I lean into it and I try and explore it and I come up with okay now I know mm. I can work yeah, on that yeah. issue yeah, what about yeah, for you Adam yeah. with your with your um self-esteem and and growing that resilience within yourself what did you see do you still have your tantrum moments too I think everyone does right <laughs> I think everyone does I I guess I wanted to talk about it because the big thing that you said there that really highlighted to me is that responsibility so, so to me is taking ownership for, I guess, 
the things you, you say you're going to, to do. And look, I, I think around throwing the tantrums, I, I throw tantrums every day. Like I still want to, I'm only 27, so I, I can still remember being like a kid and I'm like, why do I have to get up today? I want to sleep in. Hey, I'm 20 <laughs> years older than you and I still act like I'm the kid too. I, I, don't, I haven't aged one single day, mate. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I kind of got to that stage where my pop, when I'd ask my pop and I'd say, pop, how old are you? And he'd say 21. I've, I've kind of got to that stage now where it, when, when people ask me, I tell them I'm 21. Because <laughs> I just, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things. But I guess, like, I, I, the tantrums come through every day. Like, I, I guess I can relate it to, to today. Like, today, I, I guess I, I had my partner over. You know, we we're, were asleep. We had to get up. Um, I really, really didn't want to want to get up. And that, that's where that resilience comes in. Like, I, I didn't want to do what I had to do. But, you know, I forced myself to get up, have the shower. I went for a walk. Or actually went for a jog, I should say. So I did my morning exercise. And for me, that was like a big resilience. And I guess getting over that hurdle where they, they do the hurdle where it's like, you know, this big task and then it's like the reward at the end. Like as soon as I got over that, that was just, it made me feel so, so good. The fact that, you know, mm. I didn't sleep in that extra half an hour and I actually got up. It was cold. It was cold as hell, rugged up, two jackets on, and I went for a run. And then I guess when I got back, I, you know, I gave myself that, that pat on the back and was like, you know, good job for, for doing that. And, you know, that, that, that to me was, was a, a, I guess, a big step for me. So, you know, I guess talking about that resilience, you know, for me, self-esteem, a lot of it is, like self-esteem to me is, is so important. And, and it comes back, a lot of it comes back to, to responsibility. You know, uh, you know, being a mental health worker, I see this a lot with people and, and they're quite lost. Um, they don't know where they're going. They don't know their direction. And, and when you have conversations with people, you, you find out that their self-talk is just so low that they that they don't they don't believe in themselves. And, and to me, when you're talking about resilience and the, and the rubber band pulling back, you know, I guess you know you talk to people. They've tried something and then they fail and they give up. And that's as far as it goes. And, and then you kind of talk to them, and if they haven't seen it happen. They, they don't know it's the unknown that's so scary. And I guess you've really got to have the, that resilient and that grit to, to push through and, and, and continue with what you're going to say. So, you know, I believe that, you know, like dad used to say to me, like, you know, don't, I, I don't want to say the naughty word, but, you know, don't talk smack unless you're only you're going to action it. So, you know, if, you know, words are cheap, essentially, unless you're going to put the action behind it. So I guess with myself and, and look, I, I'm not, I'm not this like gospel person that everything I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do. Um, but look, for me, a big thing is going to be, you know, when you say you're going to do something, keep, keep your word, you know, the whole, your word, your, your gospel sort of thing. So for me, if I kind of wake up and, and the hardest thing for me is I'm not a morning person. So going back to that exercise stuff, so, you know, I'll set my, I've got little, little, um, little strategies I guess I use for myself, which might be, you know, I don't like getting up in the morning. So the first thing I do when I wake up is I skull a big liter of water. So then I trick my biology to go, <laughs> I need to go to the bathroom. Then once I'm out of bed, I'm like, it's not so bad. And then I go for a run. So I guess to me, there's little strategies and little tips you can do to help you with the resilience. Mm. But yeah, it all, it all comes back to, you know, I guess responsibility. If you're going to say you're going to do something, try it, you know, commitment. Keep the word and, and yeah, keep that commitment, like you said. So yeah, thank you. Well, I wish I was as switched on as you at 26. Great <laughs> heaven, there he is. Yeah, it's it. Talk's cheap, you know. People keep talking about this. People talk about resilience, they bear mindfulness, talk about a whole range of different things that did. You keep talking about that ownership component. You know, it, it is. You got to own. And instead of saying own your ownership, I said I, I always tell my my presentations that I do um, about owning your shit. You know, because that's what ownership is. Yeah. So it's actually engaging. I'm glad, I'm glad you said it. I didn't want to swear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, Alan. It's, uh, you can, Don't you worry, can... Adam. We've had a lot worse on the. <laughs> a lot worse. Uh, okay. We're all grown ups. <laughs> and I'm 40 years of age, uh, Adam. So I'm allowed to say that's on that. On the, okay. Um, <laughs> But it is, you know, when you're setting the framework, you talk about it, you talk about the triggers, you know, those, those, those strategies that you, you're understanding there, that's what works for you. And it's understanding those, those positive triggers, okay, understanding and not shying away from your not so positive triggers, but understanding what those triggers are. What is it that I'm doing? How, does it, how do I put my routine in place to, to set, the, set the very foundation? 
of what I'm going to do with my day and how I'm going to overcome everything that it is. You know, myself, I get up at 4.30, um, 4.30, five mornings a week to go into my garage gym and ride 40 to 50 kilometers and do my weights workout or before my kids wake up. But for me, that sets my day. Mm -hmm. you know, that's my trigger because I know if I don't get that workout, my wife knows who I haven't done that, that session for the day because in the afternoon, I'm already, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, and as much as I do it with the, the work that we do at Love Me, Love You and understanding self-awareness, I'm a, fully aware that I don't get that work out in the morning at 4.30, which is a stupid bloody time to do it, but because it fits in with my schedule of being a, a husband and a father and, and, and doing the work that I do, if I don't do it, I don't have a, you know, I don't have that vibe and energy that, that, that sets me for the day, you know, mm. and understanding how that works for me. So you've got to work, work your triggers and understand what they are. Something really important that you talked about then, Lance, sorry to, to, yeah, to um, interrupt Alan, but what what I'm hearing is that you've got a really set, good sense of what your values are and what's important mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. And I think that that's something that people don't talk about when it comes to resilience. I think it's a missed discussion. Mm -hmm. If you're engaged with your values and why they're important to you, you know, why are your kids and your family important to you and being a good dad, that whole context around that value of family, the context about around being a really productive person that supports people to improve their lives, that sense of value and purpose that is beyond you. Yeah. And, and linking that to resilience, that's for me the misstep. And that's one of the priority steps that I do when I work with people. Because when you want to stay resilient, you've got to go back to why, why am I doing this in the first place? Mm. Yeah. What's the bigger picture? What's it? What? Where? Where does it start with me, and where does it go beyond me? The reason why. The reason why. That's, that's the, the reason thing. Why. Like the word resilient. As I said, it's just a word. Yeah. It's everything before that. We get so caught up on all these words. We've even got uh, motivational speakers out there asking people in the audience, "What's the one word that describes you?" I just want to get up and walk out of the room because yeah. you know they're trying to get key words, and you look at somebody's. Uh, LinkedIn profiles or anything else and they've all got the same thing I'm you know I'm honorable I'm respectful I'm integrity and all these and they're just words mm. Mm. but all the words it's the actions it's everything else that becomes before that it's mm. like we know that well as I said if you you know you're riding a wave and you, you that excitement of when you actually get in there and you're doing it or you pull back and you lose all of that and you feel bad about yourself and everything else which one do you really want to feel and so, but why do so many people go for the latter and not you know go for the you know, the former not go for the wave itself not go for the excitement so what is it that's holding them back as you said maria what values what other thought processes are going on there why is that more important to not do it than to others the few that to get out and do it i think we, you said it before uh, adam about uh, fail, failing right yeah there's this unbelievable fear that people have because generationally it's been wired into us we should fear that <laughs> failure you know and we know people don't like failures but failure is not not achieving something failure is not having a crack i'm going to keep mm. saying it that's it's it. actually not having a crack at it because you know it's you're not failing at things because mm. you're doing things you're, you're you're taking action and you're making it work for you you know which aligns in with your values we talk about but if you're putting those and things in place, you, you, it's your learnings. They're, they're, they're not the, you know, you, you, don't, you don't get into the end of the day and you don't have the scoreboard and say 10, 10, you know, 10, 2 sort of thing, or we don't have the scoreboard at the end of the day in terms of what you've achieved through the day. But you, your learnings, you know, every, every experience, every action thing that happens from your day, from the time you wake up and, you know, you have your litre of water out and go to the toilet so you can go for a run, it's a learning. You know, but the more you can learn from it, every single process, you know, mm. that comes with the, the reflection component, you know, mm. because instead of just going, okay, this is what I do, this is how I go about it, and it's, oh, awesome. How do, we, how do you reflect on it? Because, you know, at the end of the, you know, and don't do it at the end of the month. Reflection is not about things at the end of the month saying, oh, how was my month? I can't remember what I did yesterday. You know, it's, that's the thing. You, you, you've got to be able to take that time when we talk about, we talk about a lot with um, that ability to disconnect. Yeah. Mm. So in terms of because if you keep carrying your movement forwards and your experiences by the time the end of the day, 
you get to bed. That's why people can't sleep because they haven't disconnected from what their day was. Right? So the experience is all what was happening. But I can disconnect and reflect on, okay, how do I go about it today? Boom, boom, boom. And all right, this is how I can make it better for tomorrow. And the same thing and the same thing. The more I can reflect and then actually reconnect um, into my day, they are often going to be. Yeah, well, yeah. I keep seeing people have to, they're, they're acting as though they've got to win. They're, they don't want to fail and they want to be in control. Yeah. And we want all those things, but nobody's doing anything for those. Yeah. We don't want to fail, so we won't do anything. Well, you pretty much failed to do anything. So yeah, you've already right. failed. Oh, no, so is it a, a fear of failure or a fear of actually getting out there and being successful? Yeah. And wanting to be in control, but not taking that control by saying, right, as you said, Maria, it's a matter of choice. Nobody does anything to us. They can, things can happen around us, but it's how we respond to it. What choices we make as to whether something affects us or not. Nobody else can hurt me. They can do things, but I only get hurt because I take that on. I, I allow that to happen. Mm. I accept that that was my, that would be my choice. My choice is not to be. So I'm always looking, well, how can I be in control? How can I be, um, uh, you know, get things done? How can I be successful? And the only way I can do that is by moving towards that as opposed to hanging back from it, which yeah. seems to be the thing that everybody does. And then when they fail, it's always the world that was against them. And there's their excuse. And they say, well, I, I was resilient, but was. they haven't done anything to be resilient. I was I was resilient, and then I was parked it. Now I'm going to be something else. Am I? Now I'm going to be. Yeah. But you know what? Once you start on that journey, I, if you're really on it, you never want to go back. No. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> you just yeah. want to keep ascending. You just want to keep going. All right. Yeah. So the that's when you know you're in it, really in it, because you you want to keep enduring. You want to keep going. You want to keep growing. You you're. It's almost like you um you accept a certain level of belief in you that life is about learning. Life is about growing. Life is about being the best I can be. I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to settle, but I can always be kind and compassionate to myself. Mm. Yeah. No, it, it always starts with me. Um, so that's, that's the real, um, the, that's the really important um, uh, stuff that people who are resilient, they just accept they're going to have to adapt. They're going to have to change. They're going to have to grow mm. and that's okay. They're really comfortable with it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I think talking about that, um, I liked what Lance said around the, the values, things like that. I think, uh, I guess they, they taught it in sales just to change the mindsets right around failure. Like I kind of wanted to get to fear. So I'm really glad that we eventually got here because I love this concept. So uh, for me, you know, I, I had to change my mindset. Like I, I you know, that whole thing of, of failure, the, the fear of failing, like, as we just said, I really changed my mindset on this and, and it's a sale, I guess a sales analogy that they, there's a book on it and it's like celebrate the fates because, you know, when you can't change that mindset, that failure isn't bad. It's, it's just a learning process. It becomes a lot more interesting. So I guess for myself, you know, I guess as you're door knocking and that sort of stuff, you know, when you when you have so many, you know, when you when you're knocking on those doors and you feel the energy kind of drop, that, that's when it sort of sort of affects you. So if you change the mindset to, you know, like this is all learning, and then you go back to that reflection, like Lance said at the end of the day, okay, what did I learn from this? What will I change about this? What can I do better? You know, that growth mindset versus scarcity mindset. I think that's where you're going to get true resilience and that true improvement. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, there was something else I, I kind of wanted to touch on with this. And, and it, it's, you know, everyone wants to get to the, the, you know, the Maslow's hierarchy of law, like the, the self actualization of like, that's the big concept and the big goal. But, you know, people forget the other steps along the way. So, you know, I find, you know, this really interesting of, you know, how do we get there? What, what's, what's the goal here? How do we be resilient? And, and to me, it's getting really comfortable being uncomfortable and, and being okay with failing. You know, I guess I, I, something Gary Vee talks about is like being down at 20, 20 goals or 20, 20 scoreboards, or I'm oh, sorry, I don't know the American terminology, <laughs> uh, but you know, being down 20 points uh, in the first quarter, people look at that as, oh shit, I've lost. 
Like, mm. but you're only in the first quarter. You still got three quarters to go. So like, let, let's keep going and, and keep pushing. So I guess for myself, I've I've kind of had that that mindset with, and, and I guess it's a it can have a bit of a downplay on me because you know I'm only 27, so I am quite young. So I guess one of the things I had to do is I was always trying to push myself to go harder, to be better, to do more. And I guess coming back and, and having that, those talks with myself and being okay with, you know, for instance, if I've gone a run, gone for a run, I might have done five Ks in X amount of minutes, you know, and then I, I tend to push myself and then I get injury, which, which we all know is bad. So I guess going, you know, it might have taken me 30 minutes to complete the run, but going to, to evaluate that and go, was that my best? Okay, that's okay. Like, I'm okay with that. I guess it's better that I did the action and, and, and got the, the goal, I guess, of, you know, going for the run versus, you know, not doing it or pushing myself too hard and getting injured and burning myself out. So, you know, I, I just really find this quite interesting topic. Yeah. But if you want, if you want more time, Adam, bring up the fact that you're 27. Oh, Alan, oh, I will too. I'm just about yeah. to say in that I'm yeah. a bit, bit upset with that. <laughs> and the fact, uh, Lance, that you said 40, if you put the two of you together, you've still got another year to go to get to me. So thanks very much. Yeah, probably, probably. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Like, I, and, and Adam, if you can't say that word, but uh, Lance can, what the hell can I say? Yeah. No, we're not, no, and you know what? Age is such a number that people put far too much stock on. Yeah. So I focus on midlife, which is, you know, focusing mm. on an age bracket. But there's this midlife curve. It's a dip that happens at 47. I'm 47. where we're meant to have this amazing crisis in our lives. Mm. And I, I can understand why. Because people put too much stock on turning mm. 50. Mm. And it's yeah. like, I'm three years off 50. And, oh, my God, I haven't done what I've wanted to achieve by now. And, oh, this, this I've only got three years to achieve it. And there's so much pressure but we're going to live for another 50 years. So chill out because we're living longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see. I, I really love that. And I guess to put concept on age, because this was actually a really powerful story and, and it really shows. So when I was younger, there was this old man that was, I, I mean, when I was a kid, guys, like yeah, when yeah, I was yeah. 10, so uh, I there, was, there, there was a, I, I, and getting to it, I only saw him a couple of years ago. He was 70. And every day on his bike, he rode 200 kilometers every single day. And when, when I was, uh, when I was 10, sorry, that's my work phone. When I was 10, I remember riding around the block and, and what I would do, it would take me, what I would do one time, he would do 10 times and he was 70. Hmm. So I, and I saw him the other day, uh, well, it wasn't the other day, it was about a year ago. Um, and he's still riding the bike. And I kind of stopped him and I had, cause I'm, I'm now 27. So, you know, it was probably 17 years ago. And I said, you're still getting up every morning. And he literally said that he's like, age is just a number. Um, he'd probably be what, 87, 90 now. And he's still riding 200 kilometers every single morning. Like, that just puts a concept of like the power of will and the power of the human body. Now I'm 27. I'm not riding 200 kilometers every day. So, so that just really shows you like the, the, the level something that... to work towards adam <laughs> well i've always gonna, had that i was just going to say too lance did you notice after you told him not to mention it again how many times did you say yeah, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. <laughs> my whole attitude to it is i heard many years ago that uh, most men by the time when they retired only live for 2.7 years after their retirement so that's one of the reasons why i've never retired and never will retire yeah. i've got too much living to do and too many things i want to do not yeah. too many things, just heaps of things I want to keep doing. And when I take one off the list, I put two more on. And yeah, I can't go absolutely. until I finish that list. So, guys, you're stuck with me. <laughs> for, another, for another 30 years, apparently. Maria? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my dad's turning 90 in January. So, um, I what I've learned from him as far as longevity of life and, you know, I, I, I truly believe that retirement is needs to be re-managed, reimagined and is completely redundant. Mm. But what has kept my father going over those years, other than a very supportive Greek wife who is... Please <laughs> 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 make a call. Uh, that helps, let me tell you. Um, but <laughs> it's his mindset and it's always been his mindset. And yep. he always had his highest value, which was his family, Mm. And his biggest passion was, which was to build things from scratch, which turned mm. into and always was his garden and his 
his, um, you know, lemon trees and his zucchinis and his eggplants and his pumpkins. And we live in, we, I'm from Darwin, so there's dragon fruits and all sorts of tropical, you know, pawpaws and everything going on in my dad's garden. He loved building things from scratch mm. that nurtured his family, which was his highest value. And he now gets up with his macular degeneration, not mm. seeing very well. And he gets into his garden and he works there in the heat of Darwin, whether it's wet season, dry season, build up, doesn't matter. He's up at 5.30 in the morning and he's tending to his garden. Yeah, and that's a and brilliant he, he example. pumpkin for his uh, eggplants. Yeah. Sorry? And he mistakes his pumpkins for his eggplants. Yeah, yeah. And then he forgets his glasses and my poor mum's got to go and find them. But, um, yeah, it is, it is, that is, that is my inspiration. He's my biggest teacher uh, around how we have a, a really amazing, resilient, lo long life. And that is to mm. always be engaged yeah. within our sense of purpose and our yeah. values, always. Yeah, that's a perfect example of, as you said, the values and the purpose um, and sticking to those. And that's, People would say that's resilient, but it becomes just a, a way of life. It becomes mm -hmm. something that happens every day. I'm not sure if you uh, said to him, well, that was great resilience and everything else, you'd probably go, no, that's just life. No, I, 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 I'd talking. have to find the Greek English dictionary and find a translation for resilience because I don't know it in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but that, that sense of purpose, you know, recreating an identity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, linking it back to the identity. Yeah. Something I guess I would, I would ask both of you and, and like, I guess what's, what's some of your, your strategies, I guess, to, to be resilient? And Lance, I guess for you, I've been trying to get up at 4.30 every morning. I've tried to get up at 4.30. I used to get up at 4.30. I, yeah. it, I just can't do it. So that's like, you know, what do you use there to, to trigger yourself and, you know, what strategies you got? Um, <laughs> strategy, my, my number one, I get up now at 4.30 to do it um whereas a lot of my life i was getting home past 4 30 for, for a lot of it um right because uh and i think that's what i do and i attach myself to that my uh my, my story goes is that uh you know i was a i was an afl footballer back in the day yeah for, uh, for eight years but post my afl career i was a i was a drug addict um and a lot of my time was uh, spent uh, awake <laughs> um and, and in a world that just wasn't real um and I attach myself to that, and I and I use that as my motivation every single day, because I have a I have a tattoo of a phoenix on my uh, on my lower leg, on my foot, a big thing, and so every time I wake up, at the recognition of what my life was, and my learnings from that, and go that's my motivation. If I need any more trigger, to understand that I'm getting up at four thirty in the morning so I can be alive, I'm going to keep doing it. And yeah. It's going to make me feel good, and then my kids. You know, you go, oh, that's a, it's a, it's a role model position that I play. You know, and I use yeah. that as a, as a trigger for me. And, and I get that, that experience with my, my kids to understand what that looks like. Um, but, you know, the, the trigger for me, one, might the alarm. And my, and my, my alarm is get up and get your shit done. That's, <laughs> what, that's, that's what it says. That's my alarm. So yeah. I look at it and go, bang, all right, let's go. And, and, and you've got to make it work. You know, and, you know, you talk about the values before. My, my biggest trigger in life is is, is family. Yeah. And, I, and I say my biggest trigger in life is family because eight years, just over eight years ago, I, I attempted suicide and it got me to a position that, you know, I, I'm, I've had this great sense of purpose with my life ever since that, right? That family is king, queen, prince, princess, court jester, the whole thing, everyone in, everyone's in there. But everything I do now is for the benefit of not my family, it's of me to be able to be a, be a part of my family. Mm. Because without me, I don't have my family. But without my family, they don't have me. You know what I mean? So I, I connect that and, and I make that work every single day. And I make it, and I do. And I'm not sure of how I talk about my family and, and the impact that my wife has had on my life. Um, you know, and she's the one that saved my life. You know, so, you know, there's a level of resilience that we talk about with a person that's going through crap themselves, but the actual level of resilience that people have that are caring for people that are going through challenging experiences, you know? So, you know, and, and I look back on, you know, also with my family, my dad come out in the bottom of a boat to this country, he lived in immigration camps for five years before he landed in Australia and then ended up being a, a playing for the Socceroos. And my dad played for Australia in the soccer. 
you know, in terms of what his life was and then put himself into a position. You know, I learned from that and I attached myself to that because there's no greater motivation than to see people that you're connected to, them overcoming the challenges as well. You know, you, you make that work and, you know, but then, then, there's, then there's my mum, you know, she's had to live with my dad for an extended period of time. She, she's still married to him, which is an amazing feat in itself. But then, you know, growing up, three kids, she had my brother when she was 18 years of age. And then she still become a, you know, she became an award-winning um, business person, you know, in, in her field. So, you know, you, you, you take on these motivations from not just from your own experiences, but from the people around you. And I think you need to attach yourself to that because if you said before, Maria, about attaching yourself to the values of, you know, your, your father going through those experiences and what he does, take that as motivation. You know, and, and, and it, you know, I get sick and tired of people using the word inspiration, right? Because inspiration lasts back. And it's not worth anything until I, because as soon as I've said it, it's done. But if I attach myself to the very value of motivation and how I actually achieve things and how I go about things, it's going to be a lot more sustainable and it's going to be a lot more powerful and impacting moving forward. And I'm going to get up at 4.30 every morning and I'm going to do my 40 to 50 Ks on the bike and I'm going to lift my heavy weights and I'm going to do all those sorts of things. And, you know, then towards the end of the day, I am going to treat myself with a little bit of chocolate or a donut, or a slice, or anything that I want to, because I'm actually putting the effort into myself, but learning from it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. A lot of good stuff in there, because I'm hearing the, you know, the resilience, it's about the values, it's about the, um, the effort that we put into it. What I'm hearing from all the people who are doing great things today, gone through adversity. So what they actually have is they have the knowledge of both sides. They have the knowledge of what the, you know, the, the downside is, and they know the upside. And they can make a choice, which comes back to what you were saying, Maria. We have to make a choice. It's, it's our choice as to whether we move forward or we don't. Yeah. So if you've got, and this is the thing, if you, you need, as you said before, having that cool toolkit, having the right people around you, help you to get a taste of what the upside is, if you've never had the upside, to then go, oh, do I want to continue with what I've had before? I don't want to move on to this new experience I'm having and then turn that into the experience that I have every day. Mm. Mm. So, and uh, if I can, and if I can provide a female perspective on something that's mm. that I'm really passionate about, is that um, often when I talk about the five most important values with women, um, finances don't come up at all, mm. right? And I um, would really like to get the message out to women. I was raised by a mother who said to me always, "Stand on your own two feet." don't need to be dependent on a man, get yourself educated, be your own person, even though she didn't have any of that, right? Mm. So um, I, I really believe that for women, we've got to step up and, and, and build that financial freedom for ourselves because we spend money differently. We target our money differently. We have a different way of expressing ourselves in the world which I'm not saying the way that men do is wrong it's just been the dominant and we need a bit more balance <laughs> right so if, if if you are too afraid to put money into one of your values create a context about around it so my context for creating wealth for myself means that I have financial freedom to support the things that are important to me and make the world a better place now doesn't that feel nicer Hmm. It's also a case of not needing, you know, it's like when I, my boys were growing up, I taught them how to be able to work, but so, so iron, cook, do everything themselves. So when they had a woman in their life, it would be because they wanted her, not because they needed her. Hmm. And I think there's a case for everybody. If we're, got the th if we're able to provide the things that we need, then we don't want for anything in life and our life's completely com different values. We, we're not reliant on somebody else. We're not dependent on them. But as the way, um, Lance, you were talking about before, about your family and everything else and how they're valuable to you, but you're also valuable to them and you're together, you're something greater again. We complement each other. But in that particular uh, uh, position, we're no longer dependent. We're actually interdependent. We're connected with each other and we give value to each other. So we don't need each other, but being together just gives us so much more quality in life. Yeah. I think one of the strongest, um, uh, there, I watched an interview a long time ago on Oprah Winfrey with, um, it was Goldie Horn and um, 
oh, who was the other one? Susan Sheridan. And they said, we choose our husbands. We're not forced to be with them. We have everything mm -hmm. we need. We're there by choice. That's it. And yeah. the, the, the empowerment in that, that so many women lack because mm -hmm. they don't have a financial choice. Even today in 2020, yeah. um, the issues we're seeing around, we, the last time I was on the panel, we talked about domestic violence, the disempowerment of women when they have children financially. Um, and I think that that was probably one of my biggest, um, uh, learning curves is that that i actually went through that I, I i not intentionally i just had none of my own money yeah. so if, if anyone's 27 out there and listening <laughs> and want to have babies in the future create a fund that is a financial fund just for ladies create your own baby fund mm -hmm. take responsibility for having your own financial freedom while you have children because create income streams, do whatever you need to do because it's so important that, that we are partners, that there is no um, loss of, of, of that equity when you're with someone. Yeah. So, that's something that I wanted to touch on because that was something that's a, a big thing for me. When you're talking about values uh, within relationships, I guess I, I've identified and, and it's only, you know, I, I've watched my mum and, and dad, their, their marriage or, or partnership wasn't very good. And I've always asked myself, like, you know, would I, I guess it's been hard with dating because dating's a bit different, but like, I don't want, I don't want a, a mate. I want to, I want a partner. So I guess going through that is, is kind of, and I guess I, I would talk to you because I'm not experienced enough to, to do that yet, but I guess whatever I have would be theirs because we built it together. So I guess when it, when it comes down to that and that resilience, that self-esteem, you know, I guess it would be having those conversations of, you know, when we're ready for, for kids, what you said, have we built up that financial freedom? You know, what are you, what are we going to do when we're going to go through this? How, how can I still provide? And I guess I wouldn't, I don't want it to ever be that it's, it's my money or it's, this is my house. It's our house. It's our family. It's, you know, ours. So I guess when it, when it comes to that, I guess, you know, I got a friend that really talks and educates me around this who's a financial planner. If she's listening, she'll probably know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, she always talks about building stuff together, but she also talks about like when we get into like law of attraction is, you know, she's really trying to build her own wealth so that when she attracts a partner, she's got something to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. and, and I've watched a lot of my friends, you know, one of my friends, he, he, he you know, he, he's quite, he's reasonably successful, um, but he seems to attract the wrong kind of mate. And the mate that he, he's, that he attracts is, you know, the way he attracts him isn't good. So he gets the wrong side of girl and, and the girls that he is like, they always want him to pay for everything when they go out, you know, they, they want to, you know, whenever they do anything, that's what it is. And as soon as he kind of says, it really affects his self-esteem. And, and this is what I want to get into. Like this why I just, you know, want to do the podcast I'm doing is around that ownership of yourself. You know, he feels, I guess, victimized when he can't afford something. And, you know, he feels as though that he can't provide the level that he, that he can. And it's, it's quite embarrassing when, he, when, he, when he's in that situation. So I, I guess, you know, for myself or anyone that's listening, that's probably hearing this, you know, I would do it Marie saying and kind of, A, if you've got a partnership, have that conversation together. But B, you know, look at investing to to create those sources of income. But, you know, I guess when it comes down, it's like communication between you and your partner. You know, you don't want, if you're very, you know, this is mine and this is yours. Like I, I would say that partnership's doomed to, to fail because it's not working together. Now, I don't want to say that as a blanket rule because I'm not experienced enough to do that. But, you know, I, I would like to think that in a relationship, as I said, everything's partnership, that you'd be having those communications, you know, that conversation, sorry, and communication with your partner to, to determine what, what's, what's what. And I guess, you know, I think also when it comes down to it, who's going to be the role in what? So, you know, if, if you're okay with you being the, the male, the dominant person, you know, if you are going out and earning the money, it's not your money, it's our money. So that it's still an equal playing for it. And then... The, the, I would say the woman for myself, you know, 
when I when I eventually do start my own own business, for me, it's not going to be my business. It's going to be our business. And mate, while I might be because I'm the dominant personality, whilst I might be the bigger face, you know, I guarantee I won't be able to get to the level I want to without my my partner there helping me along the way. So you know, I would never want anyone to feel that way. Where you know, it's very you know male female sort of role. I think everything should be coming together. And this whole um, you know concept around you know women's rights. I'm a I, I hate to use the word feminist because it has such a I guess a negative term in the media right now. No, um, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay, this is just from my my perception. Um, Feminism so, is fantastic, but so but humanism is also very important. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Let's let's be clear. Let's being a humanist and accepting people for their individuality and their um, and their differences and their strengths and their talents and 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 and, and just really caring about people in general. Yeah. Great, but yeah. feminism yeah. still needs to be there. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. Okay. Both feminine and the masculine. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> need to be there. But, you know, we talk about positive and negative. Really, forget about that. I think both the masculine and the feminine need to be there, focusing on the human. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's kind and of my point whenever I... In the, in the gross uh, direction. I think that's it sounds like important. financial resilience is another topic for another day. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I think... It's huge within itself. <laughs> yeah. Should it be a case of, um, uh, you know, in some cases it's mine and yours, and in other cases it's ours, seems to be a combination of mine, yours, and ours. Yeah. And the ratio of how you then set those up is so that the, what's the point is the focus, the focus on the hand, on the family, then great. So that both parties then feel like they are independent, they are individuals, but right. realising that when they come back and come together in that human state, they are complementary and they yeah. are so much greater again. Yeah, absolutely. That, uh, interaction. I think the biggest learning, I guess, I've learned, and, and I guess I have had some, I guess, mentorship in this, and, and it's taken me a long time. Like, and when I'm saying long, I, I, you know, we keep bringing up that I'm 27 now, but, <laughs> uh, but, Bang. you know, it took, <laughs> nah, that's it. No, I speak anymore. Um, I guess. For me, you know, I would always, I, I was that male dominant, whereas I was like, I've got to buy my own house. I've got to have all this and it's all going to be mine. It's taken me a long, uh, like a couple of years of, of reflecting on, on that. And just, you know, someone said, would it be easier to do all this yourself? Now, people, and the big goal is the house deposit. Now, you know, I, I'm now working out that, you know, hey, I, I mean, there's other ways to do this, like friends and things like that. But you know, if you had a partner, it's a lot easier to combine your resources and get that goal versus going out on your own and, and trying to get it. Now, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but it's just taken me, you know, a little bit of, I guess, working out now that I'm like, okay, if I want to have, you know, this big luxurious lifestyle, I can do that by myself, but wouldn't it be a lot easier and a lot better if I do that with someone? Now we're combining our resources together and we're going to get to the common goal. Now, I think Lance has a topic here that he wants to speak about. <laughs> Lance? Yeah, I'm picking up on the fact that it's not going to be easier. It doesn't make it easier <laughs> because the more you get, the more you want. Yeah. Um, so and in terms of what a luxurious lifestyle means, it means different to different people. Yeah. I think with, you know, like my, my wife and I, you know, we've been through some challenging times and all those sorts of experiences, but he's talking about we can bring it back to the experience and learning from the experience mm. us as individuals and as collect as a collective, so in multiple people, the more we can enjoy these experiences and learn from these experiences together, mm. because getting material getting um assets and all those sorts of things in terms of to deal with finance, um, you know, they come to go. You know, I have a lot of people in my life and, and connected into our organisation as well that have had everything and lost everything. And right. everything and lost everything. Mm. But, you know, how do we, and, and they're trying to take that, um, that role, as you keep saying, taking the role of being the dominant figure in a, in a partnership, not in a relationship, in a partnership, because a marriage and a, and a long-term a relationship with a, another person is a partnership. Hmm. That's right. and you, you would need to play your roles together, and but I can't do what I do without the the impact that my wife has in her life in able to lift me. 
you know, and she needs and have her understand. She needs to understand her identity and how she's having the impact because without her being the strongest person in the world that I know, but the most, also the most understanding person that I know, the most caring person that I know, I can't do what I do. Mm. Mm. But I learned from those experiences and how she goes about things because I, I, I come from a world that from, apart, apart from being Eastern European, I played AFL for eight years, I was a drug addict and I was a personal trainer and the learnings from I took from what that world was, but more from what the world is with the people around me. Okay. So from my wife, my mum, my sister, my brother, and you know, my close friends and my dad and my kids, they're the very foundations of lifting me up and up and up. And we lift each other up. And the more we can lift each other up in these experiences, whether in whatever domain you're in, the better off we're going to be. Don't play, we're never in, the, in our lives. If you start taking, if you think you make the choice to be the dominant figure, you are the one, you are the chosen one, you put yourself up there, you're going to fall off real quick. Yeah. Really, really quickly. So. And if you put yourself up there, it's actually really lonely as well. Mm. I go into Eddie's, it's super lonely place up the top mm. because having been in a professional sports world, having doing the work that I do here, it actually is, if you put yourself and you perceive yourself to be that person up there, it's really lonely. You know? um, but if you surround yourself with the people and we're all lifting each other up, so we're all on top, mm. happy days. Yeah. So if somebody just wants to be the man, as you said, it's a lonely well, woman. place. You're always looking over well, your shoulder and everything absolutely. else. But if you want to be a man, then that is the quickest way to become the man in the area in which you work because everyone's unique and everybody brings value. So yeah. in that area that you bring value by having been a man connecting with everybody else and being co in collaboration, the community and everything else, you're at a higher level than you were before. So in comparison to where you started, you were definitely the man at that point yeah. without putting anybody else down. So what I've seen here is that in that, you know, we're, at, we're always greater when we come together and we come together into the right attitude and everything else. That's why, as, you, as Lance says, you know, a marriage is a, a partnership and a partnership only works when the partners are working together. Who's the most valuable? Well, as you said, Lance, you can't do what you do without your partner. Yeah. And that's what it comes back to. Because, you know, as I say, behind every successful man, there's a successful woman. But it also works the other way as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say beside every successful person, there's another successful person who they work with as a team. That's it. That, yeah, that's that's, 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 again. that's the, the, the teamwork. And it's yeah. choose you. You choose a person. You choose a person because of lots of reasons. Mm. But if you're connected with yourself and your values and your purpose and where you're going in life, then you're going to make better choices if you're on your right path and you're going to make that's a better it. choice in a partner. Mm. Well, I, say, I say this now in the world that I'm living, yeah. But if I, you had asked me these types of conversations 10 years ago, that would have been totally different. Mm. That was the world that I was entrenched in. And that was my ideology and mm. the, the process that my brain was attached to at the time. And that was the world that I was living. But from the, 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 the seeing the growth of the opportunities, <laughs> because life is opportunity, every day is an opportunity, and every day is an opportunity to shine. Okay. But those growth in those in allowing yourself to be a part of those opportunities, mm. better off we're going to be because it's not me, it's us. And I, and I keep saying, and I say this when we do the talks, is that without you, there's no me. Mm. And I need me and I need you. Mm. So let's do this together. Mm. You know? Because you said before, the strength and numbers thing is it's just how it works. That's it. Um, because the hardest thing you do in life is to do it by yourself. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, yeah. we've just gone off track from the resilience, yeah. but really. Well, uh, I'll, I'll bring it, I'm track. happy to bring We're it back. back. Yeah. I was going to bring it back too. I'd just I like to question. say that we haven't really gone off resilience because, as I said before, when we looked at the word, we're looking at the word resilience, but what makes resilience and what we're talking about now is a lot of that. It's the partnerships, it's the collaboration and everything else that we do. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Adam asked, uh, what, what is it that, uh, what is in my toolkit? And my yeah. biggest thing in my toolkit is my, is my, not, not only my husband, but my, my network of friends that are mm -hmm. the ones who will stand up and they say, Maria, you're, you're blowing up here 
or your, um, <laughs> or, or, you know, and my sisters are really good at this too. And, um, or, you know, you're doing, you're in the, in the, you're just, there's more you can do, or there's, I believe in you more than you believe in yourself right now. So mm -hmm. those moments where we're high or low, <laughs> And we needed people to balance us out. Mm. That is my biggest, my biggest uh, mm. tool, tool belt. Your support prize. crew. You're talking about your support crew, Maria. Support crew. Yeah. I've got my yeah, support right. crew too. So important. Uh, I was gonna, yeah. So it sounds like a lot of that's the the accountability, which could be a whole topic on itself. So mm. you know, I guess for, I I can can relate there. You know, they talk about your network and and all all the rest of it, but I guess. You know, within my my own, it's my job and, and what I do in my professional life is, you know, I guess building someone's support crew up. I like that support crew. I'm going to use it from now on. So I I guess that's that's a really important important concept of you know who who can help you. And for myself, my biggest person and my biggest believer would be my dad. And I, I remember, you know, it's a it's a it's quite quite a good story, but. You know, growing up, when I told my dad I wanted to go into business, you know, and I, I spoke about this last time with Alan on the campfire, was, you know, dad was so against it. Like, he, he was had that fear. He, he tried business, he'd failed, so he wanted to protect his little son. Um, so, you know, it wasn't until I had that resilience to, to stand up to my dad and, and I told him to, to fuck off that he actually, he actually said thank you and was like i know you're a man now i know you've got this and from that point on every time i kind of tell him something i want to do and he kind of gets scared i kind of stop him and say dad i love you that's not your role in this in this scenario here i need you to support me i need you to tell me i can do it i got plenty of people that can tell me i can't do it like i'll just go down the street and tell some of my dreams and they'll tell me i can't do it so i just need you to to encourage me and tell me that i can do it so i think and I like to tell people this is, you know, going back to like, I look at everything kind of as a partnership, but it, telling people what you need from them and they can kind of provide that. So, you know, building that support crew up is a really big thing around resilience because without that, like you said, it's very lonely at the top. So if you're going through a situation by yourself and you've got no one there, I can 100% see how people can fall off the rector, you know, and, and go down the, down the, the spiral and, and have those sort of really, really, you know vulnerable moments mm. so i guess I, I would suggest to people that are going through this is you know look for people out there there's always there's always someone in, that can help you mm. that's great because we usually finish off these uh, talks with you know something that uh, words of wisdom and thanks uh, for those from you adam <laughs> um, how about um maria and lance what would you uh, leave everyone to think about maria Oh, okay. Um, I, I would just say it is, you don't have to go it alone, just like we were talking about. No. And if you, and you don't have to only go to the people you know, it's okay to get professional help too. Yep. Um, because you're, sometimes what happens is your family gets a bit of fatigue, your loved ones, they can get a bit of fatigue if you're talking about the same things over and over again, and you might need a different perspective to get you to where you need to go. So it's okay to seek professional help and reach out and get that because often they will be really brutally honest with you <laughs> in a way that your family can't be, but they'll do it in a way where you listen because you've stopped listening to your family. Yeah. Yeah. What's so that? Like? They, all play, they all play their part. They say, That's right. They play their role. Depends where you are. I um I live this quote, and this is uh, towards the area that we do the foundation and what I do in life. And it's the greatest act of courage is to be and to own all of who you are without apology, without excuses, or without masks to cover the truth of who you are. Hmm. And you know, we talk about ownership, talk about resilience, talk about mindfulness, talk about the whole thing. Yeah, own, own your own your own your shit. Pretty much, make it work. Make it work for everything that you are and that you deserve to be. So, you know, life is an amazing opportunity to be a part of. You know, I, I've un unfortunately have had to have um, two conversations with uh, networks this week about um, people that have lost to suicide in the in this last four days, and and I don't want to have to have those conversations again and again and again. So, we need to pull together as a community, as individuals, and as a collective to make it work for each other. 
and, and allow ourselves to, to create that space and, and appreciate the space that we're in because it's um life is an, a, an amazing opportunity to be a part of yeah um, and really get one chance one crack at it excellent and that's probably a very good point to finish off on the only extra advice i would have for anybody is go back and watch the video again and <laughs> <laughs> take as much out of it as you possibly can yeah. and on top of that as well whichever person you've joled with here or multiple people get in touch with them start conversations um you're there to find these are here so you can find your own answers but also the people around you invite other people in to come along and listen to these campfire project uh, discussions as well because this is where people who have been through stuff they've been through it they bring their experience to the table and they're sharing that with you free of charge so um uh First of all, Maria, Lance, and uh, Adam, thank you very much for having been here today. Yeah, and sure. I hope you've enjoyed uh, your first thank you, uh, panel. I'm sure I enjoyed my first experience at the campfire. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. it's yeah. amazing what you, when you allow yourself to have these conversations uh, where the path takes you. Yeah. That's it. You know, it's, um, but, uh, and if you do mention one more time, Adam, that you're 27, um, and, and don't, don't contact me again. So. <laughs> One of the things I'm thinking of doing is having a panel discussion where I will step out. I think I'll let uh, Thomas Graham uh, handle it. I think he's 24 and you can say you're 27 as much as you like. Much as you like. <laughs> no. Yeah, you're more on age bracket list. Yeah, age yeah. is only a number. Only a number. That's right. fine. That's, That's fine. Right. Age is only a number. <laughs> Thank you very much. That works. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Thank and to everybody Bye. who's been listening in, we'll see you on the next uh, campfire. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.